Everyone, uh, thanks for joining an evening with myself, Guy Butters, and friends to talk football, life, and men's health. Uh, it's in support of AITC Speak Up Against Cancer campaign. I am really pleased and delighted to welcome Nikki Johns and Keith Viney this evening. I better do a short bio on both of them. Um, Nikki Johns, he signed from uh, signed with Millwall in 1976. From Millwall, he was sold to Tampa Bay Rowdies for 150,000 pounds, which is a lot of money in them days then on to Sheffield. John's experienced his great success at Charlton. Over 10 seasons, he played 288 games and was named the 1981, 1983 and 1984 Charlton Player of the Year, which is no mean feat. He later played the Queen's Park Rangers before finishing his career with Maidstone United and in 2003 he became an assistant manager with Everest Town in the Kent League. Hi, Nicky. Evening, Guy. And also, we're joined by Keith Viney. Keith played over 400 league games, the majority of which came with Portsmouth and Exeter City. Keith was named Player of the Year with Pompey fans in a 1980-81 season, and then he left to join Exeter City in August 1982, where he would go on to make nearly 300 first-team appearances, being named Player of the Year for 82-83 to and 83-84 to seasons. Keith moved on to Torrington, where he was named as manager in 2004, and then Director of Football in 2005. Hiya, Keith. Evening, Guy. Evening, everyone. Uh, the aim of tonight, obviously, is to talk about football, our respective careers, and also to talk about um, cancer. So our aim is to keep it to an hour, but it might run into a little bit of extra times and possibly penalties if we go over the top a little bit. So anyway, chats, uh, on to it now. Uh, we've all had great careers in football. Uh, what were your hi highlights in your career and your most memorable moments? And if I could ask that to Nicky first. Um, the three games that stand out for, for, for me was my uh, league debut for uh, Millwall. We played up at uh, Carlisle. Um, I only knew on, 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 the, on the Saturday morning I, I was playing. Um, and I had one of those games that everything went, went right. And uh, we end up end up winning one one nil, and it starts started off my uh, career. Um, you know, you've played played well when uh, the opposition uh, uh, goalkeeper waited for me outside the dressing rooms to uh, congratulate me on my uh, performance. Um, I, I followed that with with, with uh, a game that it was on uh, the, the midweek big, big match for for Millwall in the League Cup. We played Newcastle. Um, and Kenneth uh, Wilson uh, commentated on it. And for me, someone who's uh, commentated on in the World Cup final, and then commentating on uh, in uh, you know, talking about Bouch me was a uh, fabulous again. We, we had one, one of those evenings, we ran out uh, to two, uh, two nil uh, winners, and uh, it's a uh, it cemented my place in, in an aside. Um, it's a time I was only part, part time, uh, because my, my, I. Um, I was I was training to be a, an a, a, an apprentice electrician in Bristol, and my dad wouldn't, wouldn't allow allow me to uh, jacket it all in to play uh, football. So um, it, it was hard going. It, it's it's in the time you know being up at seven to do a, a few hours work, training for a few hours, and then back back to work in the afternoon. And and for Charlton, the Charlton supporters uh, talk about a game we played Chelsea over the year. They went up for, from the second with uh, Jeff Hurst, uh, no, John Nil is a manager. Um, again, I had one of those nights. And you only, as a goalkeeper, I think throughout your career, if you have three or four nights when everything go, goes up perfect for, for, for you, that is it when, when you come up at Abbey. Um, as I've come down in the tunnel after a one all draw, uh, there was a great Sam Bartram. Uh, waiting for me to uh, congratulate me on, um, on my uh, performance. And for someone of that stature to take the time to get down to, to the dressing room and, and to uh, speak to me was uh, very me mem memorable. Also, like you say there, you know, free player of the year awards. I mean, that is something else as well. You know, I mean, I, I was quite lucky. I got one when I played for Brighton. But apart from that, I was runner up a few times. But to actually get three of them, you know, that's some going. I think we, 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 we must have been a poor side uh, defensively. Like, goal, and the goalkeeper uh, <laughs> was having a lot to do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, on, yeah. to, on to you, Keith. On to you, Keith. Obviously, you've got a few career highlights. Do you want to elaborate on them? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Guy. Um, I, I think that one of the biggest highlights for me was signing professional uh, terms with my hometown club. Um, I'd 
go on and watch them, you know, as, as a grown up going through, you know, school. Used to go along with my dad and stand on the front end and then to actually sign for them and uh, be in a change room with the people that were my heroes was uh, absolutely brilliant for me and, uh, you know, a, a, a great, great time in my life. Uh, me and Sir John, the, uh, the legend of Liverpool, was manager at the time and uh, sadly he's just, you know, the news says he's just passed away. So uh, but that, that was... Uh, uh, a big highlight for me. And then making my professional debut against Fulham in 1976. That was in the old second division, which would be championship now. Uh, we won 1-0 and uh, I was lucky enough to be both player of the match. So another great highlight. And uh, a further one that really sticks in my mind, uh, we played against Liverpool in the FA Cup third round. That, that, that was in 1978. They were then the European champions. We played at Anfield. 40,000 supporters, um, but 16,000 of them were Pompey fans that travelled. So an absolute highlight. And I can remember it as if it was yesterday. But uh, I'm not going to divulge the result at this stage. That might be a little bit embarrassing. But still a great night. So, um, And then being voted player of the year for Pompey in 80-81 season. Again, my hometown club. I'm the only born and bred Pulse player who ever won that accolade. So... I've still got that honour at the moment. I'm, I'm sure someone will take it away from me very soon. And then I got uh, one last dubious one, and that was playing uh, in the Pompey Legends alongside someone called Guy Butters. So, so that was a, dubious, that was a top but, career uh, highlight. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's, bottom of the, it's, it, it, it's a bottom of the list here, Guy. I don't know what <laughs> the thing is. I think you're right there. Yeah, we played alongside. I, I can back you up, though, when you commented about the Fratton Park, um, sorry, the Portsmouth fans, you know, travelling into away games. i I'd done six seasons there and the support was tremendous. Um, and likewise, Brighton got similar away support and, and home support. They're very vocal. But uh, And also, you, you got two, not only did you get player of the year there at Pompey, but two at Exeter as well, is that right? Yeah, it was my first two seasons there, and uh, that, that was obviously a great honour. And uh, I think that was a sort of a purple patch in my career those four years, really. So. Yeah, it's fantastic. I mean, you know, like you say, I've, I've, I've echoed what you two said, you know, to be actually being told that you're being made a professional footballer, uh, me at the age of 18 was a career highlight. Um, you know, you go through all the trials and tribulations when you're a youngster, you, everyone wants to be a professional footballer, and uh, you go through a trial process, to, you know, um, get picked up by scouts, etc., and then one by one, you sort of see your mates get pushed to the wayside and it's very difficult to deal with. But then when you get that, you know, that little call that you're getting taken on as an apprentice is brilliant. But to actually be told, uh, you know, that you're getting made a pro um, was, was a massive highlight for me. I, um, I, my, my manager at the time at Tottenham, the professional was Terry Venables. He'd just come back from Barcelona. And um, I was told to go and see him, knock on the door. And, you know, I've never met him before. So go and see him and he'll offer you a pro contract. So I remember going back to the ground and getting all, you know, really nervous about seeing him. And I remember knocking on the door and he sort of told me to come in. And I'd done the weakest handshake I've ever done. It was quite shameful, really. <laughs> I was quite nervous, you know. And he sort of looked at me up and down. You know, you're a big, tough centre-half. That's not how you shake hands. I want a firm handshake. Out, out you go and do it again. You know, it, it sort of... <laughs> all the nerves were coming in. So I went outside, knocked on the door again, and he, he didn't answer. So I had to keep knocking. And about the fourth knock, he said, come in. And I remember, like, gripping his hand really tightly. And he said, that's better. Like, that always stuck with me. Something like that always stuck with me. So every time I meet someone now, firm handshakes. It's first impressions, of course. And then, and then obviously, my, my other highlight, um, I was so lucky enough to represent my country at under-21 level. Um, we played a tour tournament in Toulon, uh, which is, I think they still do it at the end of each season, a little mini tournament over there. And I uh, played against uh, Bulgaria, Republic of Ireland, and uh, it was due to play against another team, but unfortunately, uh, that team, they had a, there was a big plane crash uh, in the country at the time. And I think a few of the, the players had some relatives that were involved. So they, I played for the rest of the world team uh, against another team in the under-21s. And I think I captained it, and I think my claim to fame is they've never done it since. I think it's the only time they've ever done the rest of the world team at under-21 level. So, yeah, and I captained it, so that's my... My claim to fame. <laughs> but yeah, like you say, it's great. You know, I've been highlights. But those say, you know, football is played by approximately 250 million players in over 200 countries, making it the world's most popular sport. So what do you what do you love about playing football yourselves? I'll ask you again, Nikki, first, please. Um, as a kid, my my whole life was about uh, football. Um, I played for anyone who, who, who I wanted to uh, keep her. 
you know, 14, uh, I was playing in a men, men, men's uh, football. I kept the scrapbook at the time, and I've still got it. And in one season, I played 90 games. Uh, I played played for my, my school year, the school year above. I played for the teachers. I played Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon, Sundays. The amount, the amount of notes just my, uh, my mother wrote to the teacher saying, I'm sorry, Nicky couldn't do his own work last night because he, he was play, playing uh, football. But that, that was, was what my all life was, was about. Um, I was never able to, uh, I was never offered a, an, an apprenticeship. Um, and I was lucky enough to be uh, picked up at um, 18 by uh, Mined. Um, and football, I just loved every day of it, you know, <laughs> I always term it. It's like a, um, being a kid, but but you're a play, playing football with, with with adults and uh, people watching it. The most fabulous life uh, I, I had. Um, yes, there is loads, but the you know plus is really out of number. I mean, you 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 played in America as well, I'm led to believe. So uh, that must have been uh, an experience. Um, uh, I wouldn't say that. I was only uh, 20 at the time and I'd uh, become a regular at, at uh, Millwall um, and Gordon Jago was, was, was the manager and uh, he'd gone off to Tampa and then uh, he, they were having a bad time and in May they, they, they come into a uh, sign rate. They offered 150,000. Millwall snatched their hands off because they'd only paid 8,000 uh, pounds two, two and a half years of, um, prior for, uh, for, for May. Uh, the only problem was um, they wanted me to fly out the week before I was getting married. So my wife wouldn't, wouldn't allow it in case that I didn't get it back. Um, so we ended up getting married one day, flying out on uh, the following day. Um, and we fell in love with Tampa when we, 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 uh, we landed, you know, from uh, Coldwell Blow Lane. It's a meal worn or Kent Road to, to, a, to a Tampa. It was a big, uh, you know, vast difference. Uh, the sun was out, everything about it was, was great. But um, I wanted to see some games, you know, they, uh, they took me around to, to see some, some summer games. And the, the problem was, it was a start. Pelle had just finished, but France Beckenbauer was playing, uh, Carlos Alberto was playing for the Cosmos, Best Day Bank, so lots of bigger, bigger stars. But, but the pitches, um, some pitches had uh, the baseball markings, they had Astro pitch and they had uh, the grass. Um, and I got cold, cold feet, and, and I didn't. I didn't want. In the end, I had decided I, I didn't want 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 to sign. I uh, phoned the, the mill manager, George Pache. What, you know, the day I, I was due, I took to a sign. He said, "Unlucky son, we, we spent the money on on our debts. Um, you've got to go." Um, and in the evening, we had a big uh, press com conference, and they were miles ahead of us in, in England. What we're doing now is what the Americans were, were doing back back then. Yeah. And uh, they had the TV cameras, the press for me to sign. Uh, me, me and my wife pulled up in a limousine. Gordon got 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 uh, uh, opened the door, and I told him I can't sign. He went white. You know, all these people there. He he, he went white. He jumped in the car. We went down on the road. He said, "Sign, sign for me." If you don't like it, I'll sell you. Um, I, I signed that NASA evening, which, which was around the, uh, the 1st of June. I was on a, um, me, me and my wife was, we reached the final. It was on the first plane out of uh, New York in uh, September. It, I was too young. Now yeah. I love America, but I was too young. I, 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 the furthest I've been from Bristol was, was in London. Yeah. I, I, uh, the first time I went on a plane was to Tampa. So uh, yeah, too 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 young, but great great memories now. Exactly. Yeah. What about you, Keith? What do you enjoy most about playing football? Uh, it, it, I, I'm 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 the same as Nicky. Really, you know, football was in my blood. It was what I wanted to do. You know, from sort of age nine or ten, even earlier, probably used to just play three games at a weekend for anyone that you know the school team, and then anyone else who 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 give me a game, basically. But um, I can remember um, a chap called Stephen Foster. Some of the Brighton people might recognise that name. Um, but he, he, he used to meet up after school every day and play football. And in the winter, when it was dark, the only place we could, we could actually have a game of football together was uh, on the bowling green in a local park. And you can imagine how they felt about us running around on their bowling green and our studs. And we got chased off a few times. But, uh, yeah, Steve... Steve 
He was a, a great friend of mine. He went to Swampton as an apprentice, didn't make a grade. He came to Portsmouth. Um, when he was at Swampton, he was sent forward, um, but he, he started to play at centre-half for Portsmouth and then he obviously signed for Brighton and um, yeah. had some good times there. But, but the other thing around football for me, it's the team ethos, being part of the team, you know, having your mates around you, um, that camaraderie, you know, playing your own part in that, for, you know, but it's a team game. So if you do your part, the team does well. Uh, the change of room atmosphere, I mean, you two know that. Uh, it's a distinct smell and a, the banter that goes on, just, just fantastic. Uh, keeping fit and healthy is is another you know another thing. You know, a lot of people go to work all day and then they have to pay to go to the gym to keep to work. A footballer, it's just it's just part of your life, isn't it? So, exactly, yeah. And then again, it's playing. Yeah, and lastly, really, it's just play playing home games. You know, I was lucky enough to play for Portsmouth, and you know, we mentioned their support. But I remember we, in in the year that we were in Division Four, got promotion from that. That, that division that year, but we had an average home gate of over 20,000. So, yeah. you know, just fantastic to be in front of them supporters and obviously the fratting end of, you know, your Brighton supporters would have been there and, you know, sort of saw that. So, you know, just fantastic times, really. I, I loved every minute, the same as, same as most professional footballers would say. Exactly, yeah, I think you're right. I mean, like you say, you know, just to reiterate what you two said, the, for me, it was sort of the camaraderie in there with the players, you know, fellow people that you, you sort of grew grew close to. You're all in the same boat as, you know, the build-up to the games, the buzz of it, standing in the tunnel, you know, you're sort of like going out there, you know you're going in for a competition against, a physical and mental competition against other professionals, you know, and as you said, Keith, being remaining fit and healthy, we're obviously going to touch on that a bit later, you know, and just, for, you know, getting bonds with your fellow teammates, um, most of us, as, as you've both said as well, we sort of grew up watching football. I used to go and watch it with my dad and my brother. So it's been ingrained for me since I can remember, you know, ever since I could walk. I always remember I've sort of had the ball at my feet. Um, and I think, you know, you just took it on. And as we said before, you know, just to be made professionals, I think it's just the icing on the cake for it all. Um, I mean, you know, reiterating about being around players and that, fellow players. I mean, you must have come across some, some quite good characters and some funny moments in the pitches. Uh, how about you, Keith? Yeah, um, yeah, quite a few. When, when I was first uh, apprentice at Portsmouth, um, a chap called George Graham signed for Portsmouth, so, and he sort of took me under the wing, and um, he, he played in the debut I, I mentioned against Fulham, and uh, I, was, I was only I think it was 18, 19 at the time, but he took me to the Playboy Club and on, when we got back to Portsmouth, bought me a meal, and I was sort of looking around at everything, thinking, oh, my God, I've never seen anything like this, but... Uh, yeah, there's there's quite you know there's a few you know highlights and you, you can't sort of mention them all, can you? And there's some no, some you've got to watch. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I bet yeah. you. Yeah, I, I was one of the one in ones in uh, the early days where this was uh, the butt of everyone taking the mic. I can't, you know, it's a Millwall, it's a uh, eighteen year old, and uh, I spoke like a farmer. <laughs> the accent still still there. Uh, to add to it, uh, the world Warzels were uh, number one in the charts. With I got a brand new combine <laughs> harvester. Yeah, uh, <laughs> we we used to go go for uh, pre match meals, and um, there was not you know lots of Londoners in the mid mill side that that they uh, Donaldson, uh, Barry Kitchener, and they were all talking uh, uh, Cockney rhyme at, at the time, and that that was in big time. And I used to sit down at a pre match meal, scared stiff to open my mouth because I didn't have a clue what they were saying for the, for the hour. You, you know, my head was down, just eat, don't say anything. But, you, you know, looking back, it, it, it was great grounding. It makes you, a, you know, a stronger uh, a character and, it, you know, great times. Yeah, I mean, I, I was so lucky. Like I said, I, I started my career at Tottenham and, of course, it was around about the time, late 80s, when we had a person playing for us called Paul Gascoigne, um, you know, and some of the stories that I've got on him, as Keith said, you can, you know, you can't quite rightly get them out, you know, a lot of them are not clean enough, but there's there's a couple of classics that, you know, he he, he did when uh, when I was there, namely, uh, we, we signed a goalkeeper called Eric Torsted from Norway, uh, great player, you know, he, he didn't start off having the best of starts there, but uh, he grew into being a fantastic keeper for him, winning the FA Cup with them, um, but he had a phobia of uh, feathered variety of birds, so uh, Gaza, I think a lot of people might have heard this story, but Gaza knew someone who lived near him 
owned a, owned a sort of a small holding and there was an ostrich on there. So Gaza kidnapped the ostrich one day, got it in the car, had one of his mates to drive him down to the training ground. He told all the boys to get out of the changing room because Eric was in there and just threw the bird in there, threw the ostrich in there, shut the door and all you could hear was Eric screaming, you know, like <laughs> the birds flapping around. It was brilliant. And then, and then going back, you know, with you, Nikki, playing at the old, at the old den, I mean, you know, the new one's sort of quite intimidating, but I, I played there for Tottenham at the old den. I think it might have been the last, one of the last games of the season. And um, they used to have the tunnel, the plastic tunnel that used to come out. And they used to have to stretch it right to the end of the penalty area, <laughs> obviously to keep you as far away from the fans when you came out as possible. And I think this is roughly around the time when Paul Gascoigne used to get a lot of stick for his weight, etc., from the fans. And um, so we we come out of the, um, the the tunnel, and all the Millwall fans are, you know, you this that and the other. And they were chucking coins on the pitch at him, Mars bars. They were chucking on the on the pitch. So he literally ran over to him, picked a Mars bar up, undone it, ate it, and then done a moonwalk in front of him. And they, they just all started laughing and clapping. I've never seen anything like it. It's just amazing, you know. Um, I mean, I used to, I, I, like I say, I was very fortunate. I've, I finished my career at Brighton. Have you got any memories? Uh, have you ever played against Brighton? Any of you two? Let's start with you, Nicky. Uh, yeah, we, we had uh, you know, battles most most season. Um, my second season with uh, Millwall, we, we, we signed uh, uh, a few players and we, we thought thought we, we were going to do, do well. Brian Chambers from Luton, Brian Hamilton from Everton, they, they really splashed some, some monies. Um, we went to Brighton, one of the early games of the season, and uh, we, we were winning 2-0 two, two at halftime, and uh, they had a good side, the young lad Ward was, was making his name for, 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 for Brighton at the time. Um, and, half, and it was hammering down, down with a rain, and we, we uh, you know, just lost the first half, thought, yeah, this is it. We've gone in at half time, and um, as as we walk, walk past the Brighton uh, dressing room, Alan Muller is on in the door. Um, and as soon as the, the, the Brighton players went went to go in, in on the dressing room, he sent them back out outside, and they had to stand for ten minutes in the rain in the, in the middle of the pitch. Um, it done on the trip. They ended up uh, beating us three three two, um, and and really that that was our our dreams of a. Uh, Decent season uh, out of the win window then, and the other time there is a, uh, you know, it's a Brighton. We went there with a charge, and again, it, it, it was a miserable day, raining. Um, we we were kicking, we um, we were kicking down on the slope, and um, after twenty minutes, we we were five down, and you're thinking, my God, this is going to be some afternoon, you, you know, five down, twenty minutes. Um, in the in the second half, we end, end, we only conceded two and ended up you know was was kicking up on the slope and in a, we end, end, ended up losing seven one and you come off the, the pitch thinking thank God for that it could have been ten imagine you know for the rest of your life you've conceded ten, <coughs> ten goals there, there's uh, no uh, living it down exactly yeah I don't think like you say I don't think you'd be able to get over that one what about you Keith any uh, memories of playing against Brighton yeah yeah I didn't play against Brighton. That, that much, but the one that sticks in my mind was at the old Gold, Goldstones ground, obviously a local derby many years ago when uh, before the all seater stadium, so it was a full house. So it was when there used to be a bit of cr crowd trouble, so there was uh, plenty of police around and a few uh, police dogs. And um, not long into the game, uh, the ball went out for a throw in, and I ran over eagerly to fetch it, bent down to pick the ball up, and got bit on the backside by one of the police dogs. So, <laughs> for, for the next 80 minutes, you can imagine the stick that I got from a Brighton supporter. It's uh, quite funny. But, uh, was I think right? it was a draw. I think the dog had to have the jabs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. You're right. Yeah. I mean, like you say, I, I, I sort of, I think I only played there for a resi game once at, at the Goldstone, but I remember what I, you know, one of them sort of grounds that I like to sort of visit. Um, yeah, and, but I, I had six fantastic years of playing for Brighton. Unfortunately, it was at the Withdean Stadium, you know, I didn't get the chance to play at the Goldstone and I missed out on the new stadium as well, which is fantastic. So mm -hmm. I had to play at the uh, at the Withdean Stadium and the sort of athletics track going around the side of the pitch and the Portal Gavin is getting changed in, which was, you know, it was sort of like a, it was like a fortress for us, really. No one really wanted to go there and play because we didn't want to play there ourselves, in a way. <laughs> but uh, so, in your professional careers, what would you say the greatest achievements and challenges have been? And I'll start with you, Keith. Um, yeah, a few. Um, the, the, the thing that sticks in my mind it was the um, 
79-80 season at Portsmouth, I, I wasn't playing very well. And oh. um, I became sort of the front of the crowd, the boo boy. Um, and uh, it was tough times. And at the end of that season, I, I went and spoke to the then manager, um, Frank Burroughs, and said, look, I, I need to move on and have a fresh start. And um, he talked me into staying. Um, he worked with me um, through the summer. Um, and, and one of the things he said to me was, you know, if, if you walk away from this, you know, if you walk away from a challenge, you'll, you'll walk away every time it comes up. He said, just stay here and be a man, you know, and work it through. And with his help and his guidance and the hard work for the summer, um, I ended up being player of the year 1881. So it was a great sort of uh, lesson in life for me is if you have a challenge, just face it and uh, you will get through it if you, if you want to. Yeah, talking to Frank Burrows, he, he signed me at um, Portsmouth. I think he must have been his second spell at the club. Um, yeah. it was, I think it was early 90s. So it must have been his second spell there. And as you say, I, I sort of had a few troubles myself off the pitch. And he was a great help to me. He was fantastic, you know, uh, of, of, of advice he gave me. And, uh, you know, he'd been around a bit, hadn't he, Frank? He, he, knew what he, he knew what the game was about. And he, he'd had a few personal issues himself. I think he's not very in great health at the moment. So we, we wish him all the best with that. Yeah. Uh, how about you, Nicky? Yeah, I think. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, that was, yeah, generally, my, my uh, career career was was great. You know, I look back. If you said said to me at the beginning, um, I'll have a career that uh, spanned just uh, uh, under seventeen years, and um, I was lucky enough to to have you know achieve two uh, promotions: one up up from the older second division to uh, the first division, and then play against you, you know. Great players like a Rush, um, Daglish, Keegan, you know, so on. Um, I just snatched your, your hands off it, it uh, uh, as a boy. Um, to add to that, the three players a year. I also won the South London play, uh, Player of the Year, um, and I was in the divisional side at um, when when we got a, a pr promoted from uh, Division Three to uh, two. You know, um, voted on by by uh, your, uh, you know. Players from uh, different teams. Yeah. Um, so, so generally, mo most of it was 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 good. Um, I had a fabulous time when when I went to uh, Queens Park Rangers. Um, I went as an understudy to Dave Seaman, who would uh, broke his finger, his, his, his thumb. Um, I didn't play many games. I think it was about uh, twenty six. Um, but I was playing with with the big boys, your Trevor Francis's, Parkers, F F Fenix, and the lads were abs absolutely amazing. The manager Jim, Jim Smith took us away all on the time, um, and it was just just one big uh, uh, social. The lads could stay up and and have a drink as it's, it's as long as you uh, invited Jim, uh, Jim Smith out uh, with, with you. Um, <laughs> and the whole thing was, was, was great fun. You know, we, we were good, we were going abroad all on the time. It was just a different world. It was amazing, like you say, there with the links. I mean. You know, Charlton and Portsmouth. I think the uh, Portsmouth was the first game that Charlton had back when they resumed back at the Valley. Uh, yes, I, I was sub. I was sub in that game. Yes, yeah, so I remember that. And obviously, you, you worked under Jim Smith. I worked under Jim Smith as well. And I can reiterate what you say about what a great character. Sadly, again, no longer with us. No. Um, but what a great character he was. Um, we had a he had a little um, phase of on the away games. You know, he liked to have a few wines the night before a game. So. He almost sort of felt like he was doing some of his team talks, you know, still under the influence a little bit. Um, and then on, a, on the way <laughs> back after a game, he used to have this little pet monkey thing that used to hang around his neck and he sort of do impressions, but, you know, a bit of ventriloquism with it. And he'd always come to the back of the coach and he, it was his way of asking you how well you felt you played. And you'd so he'd say, what do you think you played out of 10? And you'd say, I think I got a seven gaffer. And he'd go, no, you were rubbish. You got a six. You know, it was his way of telling you that you didn't have a very good game, but you could do it. You'd get away with it because he was doing it via this puppet. It was so funny. But like you say, what a great, what a great man manager. You know, he's like I say, he's sadly no longer with us. And and uh, I had great times under Jim there. He had a lot of success when he was at Portsmouth as well. So, uh, but for me, it, like you say, I think the greatest challenge is, is being a footballer. I think is the is the the you know the test of staying fit, fit and healthy. You know, because obviously the fitter and healthier you are got more chance of getting in that team and it's just trying to stay there. Once you once you sort of got into that team, I think you've probably done the, the hard bit, you know, and, and it's then it gets even harder to try and stay there, you know, because you've always got people wanting your shirt. Um, so there's a massive challenge with that. Um, I played alongside a lot of great players when I was a kid, um, kids that I thought were going to go on certainly to make professional, but they didn't have the, 
all-round package that went with it. So, you know, they, they wouldn't be, night before a game, they'd be out doing something that they shouldn't be doing. Whereas I would be the one that would be indoors, you know, getting getting me sleeping, eating the right foods, eating, drinking the right drinks. Uh, and it's sort of an all-round package. And I don't think people understand that. You know, amount of times that you hear people say, oh, I could have been a pro, et cetera. Well, I don't think, a lot of times, I don't think you could, because you have to have that all-round package. And I think probably my greatest achievement, if I'm being honest, is the fact that I managed to play until I was 38. I wasn't expected to. I mean, people say that the football career is really short. Nine times out of ten, you probably finish sometimes a bit earlier through injury, but they reckon that you probably retire normally at 35. Uh, but I was so lucky to keep going on with that. And, you know, that's, that's thanks again to a manager that I had at Brighton, uh, Mark McGee. He came in towards the end of my career and extended my career by putting me on a fitness regime. Um, and, and good man management. So I was delighted to sort of, you know, I, I was thankful that I had to manage to have people, good managers around me that extended my career and also good players. Um, so, yeah, but um, you go on. Sorry. No. Sorry, I thought you were going to say something. No, no, sorry. So we're like, now we're going into the health segment now. So we spoke about challenges on the pitch, but we all face personal and health related challenges off the pitch too. So one in two people will develop some form of cancer during their lifetime. In the UK, the four most common types of cancer are breast cancer, lung cancer, prostate cancer, and bowel cancer. The positive message is that 90% of cancers are treatable if caught early. We're here today to talk about football, but also men's health, and cancer is something that we should all be talking about. I think it's vital that we talk about health and seek support when it is needed, because you can never be too safe. I've known a few people that have delayed going to the doctors because they think that it's something that will pass, only to find there had been something wrong. And thankfully, they've managed to catch it in time. I mean, my dad, um, he's sort of old school. You know, he, he's, he's the sort of fella that would never go to the, the doctors or the dentist it, to the stage where he was literally pulling his own teeth out at one stage because he, he just had a phobia about it. Um, and I remember once he literally was complaining of having some chest pains and stomach stomach pains and we literally had to nag him, you know, force him to go to the doctors. And it was, it was quite lucky that we did this when they investigated him. It turned out he had an aneurysm in his lower chest that could have burst at any minute. And I always remember going in there and talking to the fella who was in the next bed because he was a football fan and he'd been involved in a car crash and they found an, anne an aneurysm which was literally going to burst. So he hadn't had that car crash, he wouldn't have known. It's, it's just amazing how the body works. But I mean, obviously, you know, we're going into this now and Nikki, I know you've got a story to tell. So can you tell us how you, your own family's journey with cancer? Um, 12 years ago, we uh, lost our son, Stephen, to uh, bowel cancer. It's at a young age of uh, 26. Um, he was taken ill one uh, fr Friday night, by, buying a pizza with, with his sister, um, admitted to a hospital that, that same evening. And um, on a Monday, we, we, we were called in. I was called, called in, called in for, from a work um, in, in the specialist talk, told us that uh, Stephen had a bowel cancer. Um, it was the furthest thing from, from our minds. Uh, bowel cancer, we, we believe, was a, a, an old person's uh, illness. Um, and then he's had a, an operation, he had a, a, tre a treatment, and uh, seven weeks uh, later, we, we, uh, we had lost him. Um, Stephen was unlucky that he showed no signs. His... Um, his, his, his cancer grew up and down, opposed to, to a cross. Um, so no, no one could, could have done a, a, a anything uh, to, 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 to have helped him. So just, just like one of life's uh, an unlucky lads, I, I think. I think you took on some campaigning work after that, didn't you? Yeah, we, um, after that, we, we, we had lots of, you know, being, being a, a former uh, footballer, people know who uh, you are. We had lot, lots of people uh, contact us to say that um, I went to, to, to my uh, doctors. I, I was only 30, I was 40, um, and said, I, I think I've, I've got bowel cancer. I've got, got the symptoms. And the doctors would, would say to them, it's, um, they're, they're too young. It's, it's you know, it's uh, 50 plus, 60 plus illness. And by the time that they've been diagnosed, for many of them, it, it, it was uh, too, too late. So um, we, we thought, thought we, you know, we, we'd uh, try, try and do uh, something positive in, in uh, Stephen's name. So uh, the first year, we, we um, give out um, Bobby Moore uh, leaflets um, with the England players on in the front regarding bar cancer. 
we give away thousands of leaflets. It's a Millwall. Um, the supporters were not keen keen to uh, take 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 them because they dislike West Ham so much and uh, Bobby Moore. And yet, if Nicky Johns has got a, a bucket, would donate to a uh, um, you know Nicky's bucket. It's a uh, Bristol Rovers. They won't take them because the leaflet was red, and they hate red because you know Bristol City are, are, are red. They were taking out National Front leaflets opposed to ours, and it. At all four games, we, we, we give out the uh, leaflets. We looked around it at three o'clock and 99.9% .9 of them were on the floor. Um, people ju 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 just uh, weren't interested. So um, with my links with, with, with the PFA, not only as playing, but as a community uh, officer with, uh, you know, uh, Brighton's main, main rivals, uh, Crystal Palace, um, we we uh, work work with them to uh, try you know try and utilize the power of football to uh, raise awareness of bar cancer. Um, we got all of the leading bar cancer charities together, which in itself is a feat. Um, and for nine years, we, we funded what uh, what what what's become known as uh, the No One Score campaign. Um, every April, um, we'd have. Um, Ambassadors for, for a, a poster, and the ambassadors included World Cup winners Martin Peters, uh, Ozzy Ardenis, internationals James Milner, D D D Dave Seaman, managers Pulis, uh, Billy Bonds, uh, Eddie Howe, the, the support, and also a, um, a player from, from the, the women's game, you know, um, Ray, Ray, Rachel Yankley, um, um, Bardsley. Um, Luke, uh, Lucy Bronze and uh, the poster would would uh, go go out to all in the clubs with um, asking them to uh, put a uh, key messages out dur during April. So they, they ran the poster with with uh, you know four sy sy symptoms uh, to to uh, look out out for uh, in match day programs on websites. Clubs uh, um, teams warmed warmed up prior to games in no underscore t shirts. And they in included teams like Arsenal that the, the year they, they won the, uh, the championship. Um, I think I think ninety percent of, of the teams uh, uh, over the years were warmed up in the t-shirts. Um, we also in the second year adopted the a badge, the No Would Score badge, and lots of um, supporters would know about about it, especially at Brighton, because we've given away thousands of, of our badges that, down there. And, and what we found was that. In the first year, managers and players wore the badges, and supporters wanted to, to buy the, the badges uh, for, uh, from us because managers and players wore, wore them. And they, they, you know, managers and players have such, such an ability to get key messages across in really si simple ways. So um, we, we, we then um, decided to, to uh, give them the, the badges away every year. So every year there'd be eight, eight or nine. Key games yeah, um, dur during uh, April. Um, there's me, me and my wife helpers would, would go and, and give out our badges. In all, we give away two hundred twenty thousand badges to um, supporters, and the badges come come with with, with a, a blue a blue um, card, which will give you the, the three key um, symptoms of a bowel cancer, and it was covered in in a plastic uh, uh, cover. And in, in, in those nine years, we, 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 we give away the badges. If there was half a dozen left on the floor after, that, that was it. But what we found was people either put the badges on and put on the paper in the, the card in and the, their pockets, or both of them went in their car pockets. And if it goes in their pockets, you know the wives are going to be the ones who are reads it when they, they get home. Um, <laughs> So we, it, it was really, really positive. It's now come come to, to an end. Me and my wife's got a two 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 all to to uh, run it, and we've now now got a massive of uh, grandkids. So, uh, yeah. but for nine years, we've had, we, you know we, it, it was a fabulous uh, campaign, and we also man, managed to get get a rid of the strap line that when um, people put out leaflets, bar cancer affects men and women of any age, but it's most common in the over over sixties or over fifties. Men says, "Well, I'm I'm too young young for that." So now they're sticking it out. Bar cancer affects many women of any age. Exactly. What, so why do you think it's important to be aware of the signs and symptoms of cancer, and what should you do if you're worried about it? Um, we we put on 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 our 
if you can diagnose the, the, the symptoms early, nine out of 10, 10, 10 people uh, survive. Um, it's a myth, it's a bowel cancer, it, it, it's an old person's it, 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 it illness. It can affect anyone, it doesn't discriminate. Um, on our card, we used to put, put three key um, signs because any more men won't, won't read it. And I'm as bad as that is, is everyone. Um, the signs and symptoms that we, we have pr promoted was a, a persistent change in bowel habit to, to looser or more frequent bowel movements, bleeding from the bottom without ob ob obvious reason, a lump in your tummy or, or, or tummy pain, especially if, if a severe. If, if you had any of those symptoms, go and see your uh, GP. If you still don't get, are not happy, go back again and see, see your uh, GP. The quicker you're, you're diagnosed, the more chance you've got of us surviving. It's key to get it early, exactly. Yeah, it's a fantastic story, Nikki. Brilliant. Um, so, Keith, you also know the importance of knowing what to look out for from personal experience. So, when were you diagnosed with bowel cancer and what made you decide to first contact your GP? Um, I, I was 53 when um, I, I noticed that I was passing um, blood when uh, uh, I was on the loo when I was having a poo. Um, I noticed it. It was nice, fresh, red blood. And um, I, like a typical man, I thought well, that's something and nothing to go away. Uh, well, it didn't. Um, this went on for a few months. I was convinced myself it was nothing. Don't worry about it. Say typical man. Um, it, it then became darker, the blood, and, and really gloopy and horrible. And I still ignored it for some strange reason. I, I don't know why. And I, I can't reiterate enough what Nikia said about getting a diagnosis. I, I was just damn right stupid. But it went on. And it, I think it was about eight months later, I, I eventually, I, I, I saw what was in the loo after I'd been, and I thought, I need to do something now. Uh, I went to my doctor. Um, had an internal um, as soon as that was finished he said I think you need to get to the hospital I'm going to ring them now I'm going to go straight there um, within an hour I was in the hospital had a camera um, inserted and after a couple of minutes the doctor said uh, I can tell you why you're bleeding you've got bowel cancer and it's quite advanced why didn't you come to us sooner um, I was then uh, taken into a room and given an appointment to see a cancer nurse five days later when I saw um, the oncologist and the surgeon, they told me that I was a very late stage three, early stage four, stage four being typically terminal. Um, and basically, I was told that I need to have uh, major surgery to take part of my bowel away. And then after I'd recovered from that, I would have um, a, an intensive course of um, chemotherapy. And um, I kept asking them, am I going to be all right? Am I going to be all right? And they said, no, you've been stupid. You've left it too a long time. We can't promise you anything. We'll do the best for you. So obviously a shock. Um, so, you know, as, as Nikki said, you don't always get the symptoms, but if you get the symptoms, you know, do something about it. I, I was just plain stupid. How, how aware were you, though, of the signs and symptoms of cancer? Had you waited, you know, before making an appointment? Um, at, at first, I thought I thought maybe it was piles, and um, I, I did Google, you know, parts of blood, and I did read it, and um, you know, the signs were there. But you, you, I think you you you, you try to mislead yourself. You think you you think, oh, that that's really bad. I don't want to go there. It's not going to be that. And I kept thinking, no, it, it's it, it is maybe piles or something. And I thought, you know, that go away, but it, it doesn't, you know. You know, had that sign, and I should have acted on it, and I didn't. I mean, it must have been horrendous news, like you say. I mean, how did you feel when you received that diagnosis? You know, what was going through your head? Well, uh, it, I, it was. I, I was shocked. I, I, you know, to be fair, I was terrified. Uh, I just wanted someone to tell me it'd be okay, and obviously, the hospital can't tell you that. You know, they reassure you that they do their best, but you know, it's. You know, I had some sort of dark days, night nights when I couldn't sleep. You start thinking, you know, why me? You know, I don't deserve this. I'm, you know. But then you then then I, I started sort of thinking, well, I've been stupid, I've been stupid, but uh, I've just got to deal with what, what's on the plate now, and that 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 wasn't pleasant. So 
how, how happens it when you're with the, starting the treatment, you know? Um, obviously, I've, I've never really had major surgery before, and, and the, the surgeon said that it's probably the most uh, major surgery that people have nowadays. You know, even if, if you have a replacement valve in your heart, it's a 40 minute operation. But I, I was in surgery for uh, five to six hours, um, and I had to be sort of measured up for a colostomy bag because they didn't know, depending on where the, the tumor was in my bowel whether they would be able to join it. So obviously that was something that was uh, not pleasant to think about, that you're going to wake up and you've got a colostomy bag and you have to go through that. But like, I, I was lucky. Uh, mine was a position where I didn't have to have one. But, uh, you know, you're thinking about that as well and how your life is going to be afterwards if, if you survive. You know, I didn't know I was going to survive. But uh, starting at the, the chemo, I mean, I had chemo for nearly 10 months, quite quite intrusive chemo to try and keep me alive. Um, that's not pleasant. You know, it's uh, apprehensive before you start. And then um, I, I was taking 32 tablets a day during, during the, the, the treatment, went in cycles of three weeks. Had some really, really bad days, some, some fairly good days, but, uh, you know, I wouldn't wish it on anyone. And as I say, if, if I if I had gone earlier, I probably wouldn't have had to do that. So how, how are you getting on now? Has it changed your outlook on life at all? Have you made any lifestyle changes? Uh, yeah, I, I think um, part of the research I did on bowel cancer was it can be lifestyle, um, you know, the, the food you eat, eat you know, red, red meat and um, sugar, sugary things. It's just not good for the bowel. So I, I watch my diet. I try to keep fit. Um, but the, the one thing I... I, I, I I am aware of now, I had a, a bit of a scare a while ago where I had a blood test and the, my PSA level was high, which is an indicator of prostate cancer. And I, I was at the doctor within minutes, um, had an internal on that and then had an MRI scan, but it was all clear. So, you know, I, I've learned my lesson and I, I, you know, the one thing I'd preach and, and beg anyone else is if you have symptoms, go to your doctor. But, you know, it's, it might be slightly embarrassing to have an internal, but... You know, they're professionals. That's what they're there for. No one to judge you and you're not wasting anyone's time. Just go and check it out. And then you, at least you know. Yeah, I, I'm in the same similar boat to that. I, like you said, I didn't have the high blood count, but I I, um, I had the pains, lower abdomen pains and pains between, you know, rectum, etc. And I, I wonder what it was. And again, as you say, you hear the stories, don't you? And sometimes it's a bit of a taboo subject. Uh, so I, I literally booked in to see the doctor, had internal examination, had scans, had to have uh, ultrasound scans, you know, you name it, I had it. And thankfully for me, that was all clear. But it must, I must admit, it was sort of a worry because, you know, you know, it's like when, for me personally, I was sort of, you know, talking to it with a few friends, etc. And, you know, it's like the ribbing starts, doesn't it? But I decided to make that, that move to go and get it sorted out because I'd heard, like yourself, I've talked to you, obviously knew you from the Pompey Vets. So I knew you'd gone through similar sort of thing. So I thought I'm getting in straight away and getting it sorted. Um, and again, it's like, you know, you, you come out of there and think, what was I worried about? Because it's their job, as you say, they're very professional. Um, you know, it was in and out, so. Okay, so why do you think some men do find it difficult to talk about emotions and their health issues and about seeing the GPs, uh, Nikki? Um, I just think, you know, men are uh, meant to be the, the bread earners. They've, they've got to be strong, strong for their, families um and all of a sudden you know if something's wrong wrong with them then their, their main concern is well i'll be okay tomorrow i ought to get get us through, through it um men don't don't talk to, to their friends like 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 that you know they don't die, die, like women will, will diverse their in the most secrets of, of, of it out i don't find find men, men do what we did find with the, the no score by giving out out in the badges to predominantly men who, who, who attended the, the games, they en ended up talking about it and in a reading about, about it. Um, and it broke down a lot of uh, barriers. Keith? Yeah, I, I, same as Nikki, really. I, I think, you know, men have always been sort of the, the, the breadwinners, the head of the family. And I think sometimes you, you think, well, I don't want to waste anyone's time, you know, but you're not. As, as it turns out, but uh, 
I think it is slightly changing because uh, I think younger men now are more inclined to go to the doctor, you know, social media, you know, the awareness, things like this, you know, have made that awareness. And, and if you go back, you know, when, when we started our football careers, men, men didn't put moisturiser on and, you know, make their head <laughs> nice, did they? But, but they do now, don't they? You know, yeah. so men are changing and they are, you know, they are open up to talking. But, I, you know, I think it... It's moving in the right direction, but we're not quite there yet, obviously. Yeah, I think you're right. I think emotions can be difficult to talk about. You know, it's really important for the mental health that you do. Uh, I think, you know, if you don't feel it, you can talk to someone that you know. There's lots of ways of talking to others about your emotions and getting support out there if you want it. Uh, the Premier League have issued some really helpful advice. I think if you go onto their web search Premier, at the Premier League, uh, their Stay Well website, there's lots of information on there. Um, and again, you know, like you said, my, my dad was from a different generation. I'm from a different generation to my kids. And I think, you know, it's getting the message is getting out there gradually now. I think a lot of people, it's not so much as a taboo subject as what it was. Uh, I've got an audience questions. Uh, we have some questions from the audience about how to keep physically and mentally fit and healthy. I think a healthy lifestyle can reduce risk of cancer as well as having many other health benefits. What's the best way to keep fit then and how to stay mentally and physically fit in these times? Keith, um, I, I think you, uh, I think you need you need to go for a walk. You know, if you can. I mean, we're in lockdown, so walking. Um, you know, any exercise you can do is good for you. I think have an interest. You know, uh, I, I I live on my own currently, and throughout lockdown, I've, when I'm not, I've been lucky enough to work because I work from home anyway. But I've been decorating my apartment just to keep me active. You know, crosswords, any, anything that can keep you active through this is, is good. Once the lockdown's over, just get just get an interest that, you know, a hobby or a couple of hobbies. But then surrounding that, you know, get into some groups where, you know, you can um, you can keep fit. You know, you don't have to go, go to the gym. There's other ways of doing it, you know. But I would say gen generally, be, be, you know, have people around you that you trust, you know, if, if if you haven't got so many friends, join clubs, you know, like try things like a pottery club or anything that you wouldn't normally have done, but just try it because not only are you keeping yourself busy, you're learning a skill, you're also making friends that you, you maybe wouldn't have done. So that would be my advice. Okay, uh, sorry, Nikki, over to you. Nikki, no, um, me and my wife walk, walk a, a lot now. If, I, if I, we can walk, you know, instead of taking another car, we, we, we do, um, you know, the, the, this uh, lockdown, I've been speaking to friends weekly now, a poster every few few months. Um, it's been amazing. Different people who, who I haven't heard of for, for my years have been thinking the same. I wonder how so and so is, and it's being positive. It's uh, you, you know everything. All you know, the current uh, situation is going to come to, to a, an end. Um, hopefully, all of us will, will be be uh, be there when uh, it, it does. Yeah, certainly. I think, as, you know, at the moment we've got the chat going on there. There's lots of useful links in there. Mm -hmm. I think if you Google NHS Live Well as well, there's lots of uh, things on there. And as you say, for, for physical health, you know, getting health benefits from physical activity is easier than you think. It doesn't have to cost an arm and a leg. Doing at least 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity activity is enough to keep you feeling fit and healthy. I had, um, funny enough, it's, as it turns out today, I had a chat with my doctor, funny enough. Um, I've been undergoing some sort of tests around... Uh, felt a bit strange lately, heart beating a bit quick. Um, nothing to worry about, got a completely healthy heart, although he said it wouldn't help me, uh, sorry, it wouldn't hurt me if I uh, lost a bit of timber, <laughs> as you say. You know, everyone is a standard doctor sort of thing that with me nowadays. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I've got a dog, you know, so I literally get out with a dog three, two or three times a day, go for a couple of miles walk, uh, get enough so that I'm getting mildly out of breath and that sort of, you know, will sink me through, keep the old ticker going, etc. Um yeah, finding something you're enjoying, you know, build your lifestyle, build something that's really part of your routine. Um, and obviously, it's been difficult, hasn't it, with the lockdown stuff. So now that's been lifted and the better weather's coming in, hopefully we can get out and get a bit more active. Uh, there is some stuff, like I say, links in the chat, in the chat style that uh, will help. Uh, you can also visit uh, www.albinacommunity.org. Uh, AITC is obviously uh, their website. Uh, and they've got a health section there, so you can learn out about the free community health programmes. As I said before, NHS Live Well and health at albiancommunity.uk. These will be in the chat. Um, and it's important, like you say, that you search on all these. Uh, and it's 
also the same if you suffer from disability. You know, if you've got disability or long-term health conditions, um, it's important that you, you know, you look on these websites. Uh, I think is sharing some screens on there as well. So we've heard some powerful stories today, obviously, about the importance of looking after our health and knowing speaking about cancer. So make sure it's very important from the from the messages that we're saying that you you go as soon as you can. You see any symptoms that are associated with cancer, and on the screen at the moment is the symptoms to look out for, which include blood in your poo, a looser poo or a persistent change in bowel habit, a pain or lump in your tummy, a feeling that you haven't emptied your bowel properly after a poo, or weight loss for no obvious reason. So yeah, exactly. So get them out there. If any of them symptoms, go see your doctor. If detected early, more than 90% of cancers can be successfully treated. So yeah, one in two people will be diagnosed with cancer, but 90% of cancers are treatable if caught early. That's why it's important to attend screening, know the signs and see your GP if you are worried. Contact Speak Up Team for support or questions. And for more information about the signs and symptoms of bowel cancer and bowel screening, visit the Speak Up Against Cancer website. So any final words of wisdom, chaps, for our audience watching today? I'll go to you first, Keith. I, I would just say that, uh, you know, everything we said about getting diagnosed early, um, not only can it potentially save your life, but... The earlier di diagnosed, the less intensive the treatment and intrusive the treatment may be. For instance, with bowel cancer, if, if you if you are diagnosed early enough with the first signs of blood in your pills and like that, it could be as simple as uh, a few nodules within your bowel being lasered off, and that's the end of it. So it's not only saving your life, but it's actually saving the treatment you have to have. And obviously, intensive. Treatments like chemotherapy can have side effects that uh, you can avoid with early detection. Yeah, Nikki. Um, as, as we're finding with uh, COVID, none of us are uh, immortal. Um, it's important that if any of us have uh, any health issues or uh, concerns, you know, it's uh, important we we go go in and see our doctor. It's it's better to be safe than uh, sorry. Yeah, 100%. Uh, you know, I've put down before, you know, don't be afraid to go see the doctor. You know, that's their job. Uh, their job's to help you and make you get better. And I can guarantee no matter what you go there with, you know, they would have seen worse or they would have been more experienced and they've, they've seen it, done it, etc. So there's no embarrassment whatsoever to go and see your doctor. Um, and I think, like you say, be proactive, put yourself first and stay in the game. I think you put on your one, Keith. So that's exactly that, you know, like you say. That's it, yeah. Yeah, without a doubt. Okay, right, that's it. That's brilliant. Right? So thanks for joining us today, anyway, Keith, Nicky. I've enjoyed talking about the football side of things as well, and especially about the cancer and awareness and what you two have been through on your journeys. I think that's been absolutely insightful, you know, brilliant. Thanks for joining me. Uh, thanks for sharing it as well, like you said, about your life and health. Hopefully you stay safe and well, both of you. And uh, remember, the last message, early diagnosis saves lives, so no matter the science, Attend screening, see your GP. It's a life saving message, so please pass it on. And I wish you good evening. Good evening.